We're in Second uh, Kings chapter 13. You know, and you can't tell the kings without a scorecard. You know, we're going back and forth between Israel and Judah. And now we're back up to Israel. Uh, there's an old saying about foxhole religion, you know, that uh, when you're in a crisis, you'll promise God everything and anything. But then when you get out of the crises, <laughs> people forget, <laughs> you know. And so uh, that's exactly what we see here with this king, uh, Jehoahaz, who was the son of Jehu. And so we pick it up here, chapter 13, 2 Kings, in uh, verse 1. <clears throat> and in the 23rd year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, the king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, became king over Israel and Samaria and reigned 17 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and followed with the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. He did not depart from them. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel and delivered them to the hands of uh, uh, Hazael, the king of Syria, and into the hands of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazel, all the days, all their days. And so Jehoi, uh, Jehoaz <coughs> pleaded with the Lord, and the Lord listened to him. And he saw the oppression of Israel because of the king of Syria oppressed them. Then the Lord gave Israel a deliverer so that they escaped from under the hand of the Syrians. And the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before. Nevertheless, they did not depart from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who had made Israel sin, but walked in them. And in the wooden image also remained in Samaria. For he left of <coughs> the army of Jehoaz only 50 horsemen and 10 chariots and 10,000 foot soldiers. For the king of Syria had destroyed them and made them like the dust of, at the threshing, uh, threshing floor. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiaz and all that he did in his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? So Jehoiaz rested with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria. Then Joash was reign, reigned in his place. Now to add more to the confusion, you notice that we have a Joash in Judah, and we have a Joash up in Israel, and they're two different people, so... When uh, Joash was uh, 23 in Judah, uh, Jehu's son uh, Jehoahaz became the ruler over, in, uh, over Israel and Samaria. Now Jehu had destroyed Baal worship, but he had kept the golden calf of Jeroboam I and he kept the wooden image in Samaria. The wooden image usually refers to an Asherah which was supposed to be the consort of Baal. So you destroy the uh, Baal, but you don't destroy the image of her, his consort. <laughs> so Jehu declared that he had a zeal for the Lord, but only the things he wanted to do. He really liked killing people. You know, he just whacked people here and whacked people there. And so he really liked doing that. <laughs> now God demands what kind of obedience? Yeah, complete obedience, you know. He told the Pharisees in Matthew 23, he said, you sh should have continued to do the one thing, but not left the other undone. So they were tithing everything, which was great, right? But you should also have been following the other thing. And so God demands complete obedience. We're not to select what we want to obey and ignore what we don't want to obey. I remember someone told me years ago, that he selects the things out of the body he wants to follow and leaves the rest. Well, that's not, that's not the way it works. <laughs> you know, if you love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, you need to follow what? Everything that the Lord says, right? 
And so, uh, by the way, also, listen, everything God wants us to do is pretty clear, right? And it's doable. You know, I remember the same person told me, he said, well, you, you just can't do that. I said, well, God wouldn't say <laughs> you can do it if you really can't do it. Plus, he says, he who lacks wisdom, do what? Yeah, ask me and I'll give you the wisdom. In other words, I will give you the power to do what I command you to do. He never commands us to do something that doesn't give us the power to do it. And that's the way the Lord works. Matter of fact, that's the, in the very last speech of Moses, uh, the, the state of the nation speech, I guess. You know, he says, is there anything God is asking you to do, Hart? Any, any, anything that's not understandable? Anything that's difficult? In other words, he's saying, you know, you guys are in rebellion, but is there anything that God asks you is really outrageous? Now, if you look at some things outrageous, for example, look in the Roman Catholic Church and some of their penance things, you say, I have to do what? You know, well, God doesn't ask us to do that. He says, repent and you will be forgiven, right? He doesn't ask us to do some kind of long penance thing. And so, Joash kept the worship of the golden calves. As his fathers did, he led Israel to continue into idol worship. Now, idol worship angered the Lord like, duh. <laughs> you know, what's the first commandment? <laughs> you have no other gods besides me. What, what's so hard about that? You know. And so God had placed Jehu's family on the throne in the place of Ahab's line, but they showed no loyalty to God. Matter of fact, you know, that's another point that the scriptures make very clearly. Everything we have is owed to God. He gave you the intelligence. He gave you the wisdom. He gave you the opportunity. You know, that hit me kind of in full force when I was in Moscow. There was a lot of people I met over there in Russia who were smarter than I was, but they didn't have what? They didn't have the opportunity. You know, and uh, they, you know, under an oppressive regime. And so they couldn't do some of the things I the freedom to do because of where they live. The opportunities that God gives us is from him. Anything we accomplish is to his glory. And that's what needs to be done. So Jehu would not have had any position if it were not for the fact that God placed him there. Matter of fact, that's what he told Moses, right? He says, I'm the one that raises up, and I'm the one that puts down. And Daniel said the same thing to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, you're only on the throne because God had placed you there. It wasn't your doing. It wasn't your wisdom. It wasn't your brilliance. It wasn't your greatness. And so God... Because of his anger, uh, had Hazael, which was predicted by Elisha, to brutalize Israel because of their idol worship. Now, the golden calves did not... Now, I want you to notice this. To me, this is absolutely astounding. This is Foxhole Religion 101. <laughs> the golden calves couldn't help... Jehoiaz. I'm sure he went there many times and said, oh, would you know, we've got the Syrians here and everything. Would you help me? They gave him nothing in return. He worshipped them. They gave him nothing. Uh, so he worships these cats. He worships the wooden idols, which is the Asherahs, in vain and ruinous. Finally, Jehoiaz decided, well, I might as well try God. <laughs> I might as well try the Lord. So Jehoiaz comes to the Lord and asks the Lord for help. His idols had done nothing for him. So God showed mercy and sent a deliverer to relieve Israel of the attacks of Hazael on, and his son, Ben-Hadan III, who wasn't quite the same caliber of uh, ruler as Hazael. So the deliverer of, so God sent a deliverer for Israel. Now, I want you to notice in the text here, it doesn't say who that deliverer was. Um, so 
So there's a lot of speculation on that. We're not told who the deliverer was, but several historians have named, named two or three historical figures. But some believe, and I believe this is the correct view probably, believe that the deliverance actually came from a strange source. Okay, we don't have a map in front of you, but if you had Syria here, and Israel here, and Assyria here, Assyria started attacking Syria from the other side, which distracted the attention of the Syrians. They had to fight the Assyrians. Now you got that. Okay, now, because of that, God had sent a pressure on the other side of Syria and it relieved pressure up on Israel. And so I believe that's what we're talking about. However, think about it logically. After Assyria defeats Syria, who is next? Israel. That's exactly what happens. So Jeroboam II, the last in the line from Jehu, is able to expand his territory because the Assyrians were fighting the Assyrians. But once the Assyrians defeated the Syrians, now they're coming after Israel. In 722 BC, the Assyrians conquer Israel and they take away Half of Israel, send them to Elam. Half of Elam mixes in with the Israelites, and the two mix to become the Samaritans. And that's where the Samaritans, I know it's hard to keep track of, the Samaritans. Uh, this is all, and I'm jumping ahead of the story, but this also, we fast forward to Hezekiah, where Sennacherib had sent Ramshackle, which is actually not a name, it's actually a title of the general, ramshackle to attack and surround Jerusalem. But that's when, um, when God sends a, you know, a, uh, a noise like this chariot's coming and they, they, they chase away and ramshackle has to leave. So Judah is not captured. Judah gets another century and a half before, actually about a century and a quarter before they're taken away. And so, I know this is hard to keep track of, but uh, so Israel is allowed to dwell in their tents. By the way, the word tents here doesn't mean all of them were in tents. It just meant, what it literally means is the fact that they were able to dwell outside their walled city. They no longer were trapped in the cities. They were go, could go back home is what, it, what, what they're talking about. And didn't have to be sheltered. Now, I want you to notice this. This is, this is absolutely an astounding thing. Uh, he says, after all this, Jehoiaz was left with 50 horsemen. And how many chariots? 10 chariots. <laughs> I mean, this, this is not even used a normal guard that's around the king. And 10,000 infantrymen. That's actually a police force. <laughs> That's that's really that's really that's not an army at all. When you're talking about battles that took with hundreds of thousands of people, and you got ten thousand people left, you really don't have anything left. And so, so they're down to to about nothing. They're at God's mercy. However, this is what astounds me. This in fact, after God showed mercy, and God relieved. Um, Israel, they went back to worshiping idols. Now, what did the idols do for Israel? They didn't do anything. It is when they called upon the Lord, He's the one that showed mercy and delivered. But after the crisis is over, they go back to worshiping the golden calves. <laughs> no sense of gratitude. You know, there's, there's three things we always have to remember if we're going to stay right in relationship with the Lord. Number one, there has to be a fear of the Lord, right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Secondly, there has to be some kind of gratitude, right? The reason why we praise the Lord is because, you know, He's gracious and loving and, and He gives us. Then there has to be some kind of submission, right? And so, after the Lord delivers, well, Jehoaz forgets all about Him. He goes back to worshiping the golden calf. And so they continued to worship the idols. Now God allowed uh, Jehoahaz to reign for 17 years. 
but he was afflicted by Syria throughout his entire reign, and he refused to repent. He only called upon God when he was in desperate situation. And many people do that. Many people only call upon the Lord when they need him. But after the crisis is over, they go back to their own way of life and forget all about them. You know, to me, one of the most outstanding and fearful verses in the Old Testament is Ecclesiastes 5.4. He says, if you make a vow, you better pay it because God takes no pleasure in fools. You know, if you make a vow, you better what? You better pay it because God takes no pleasure in fools. And, and so, so we make a vow before the Lord, we better pay it. So Jehoiaz, he comes there, oh Lord, help me and everything else. And, and he goes back. Well, all that's going to be held to account. And so he refuses to repent. He was only called upon God when he was desperate. Many people do that. And God will not be mocked. All this will come to account. All, all this will be held by charge. Make sure your sins will find you out. So by rejecting the evidence that God sent us, we pile up more judgment against ourselves. I always thought about how accountable the Pharisees and the priests when they saw Lazarus raised from the dead. And instead of saying, oh, this guy is the son of God, they said, we can't allow this guy going around doing this. <laughs> and Caiaphas says, don't you know that it's better for one man to die than the whole nation to perish? Well, he didn't know he prophetically had said that Jesus would die for the, for the nation, sins of the nation. Now, it makes no sense to rely upon things that do not work and cannot save and rejecting the living God who's the only one that can provide relief. If one calls upon God for help, is that person not acknowledging that there is a God and he's the only one that can help? And he's the only one that really can provide for us. If you acknowledge that, why not serve him? <laughs> you know, short-term praise fizzles like a spark. I've seen it over and over again in the ministry of over 40 years here. And yeah, people who the God does something, they're just praising the Lord. I don't know why any, everybody's not praising the Lord. And this is wonderful and magnificent. Why aren't we all just, you know, just lifting up and, and singing praises? Then after a while, they just fade away. Because this all was an emotional response. You cannot carry on a spiritual life by an emotional response. And you cannot carry on a spiritual life in the flesh. Can't be done. And I've seen people up and down, depends on what their flesh is doing. You know, the redeemed the Lord has to say so. They have to serve him with a whole heart, no matter what's going on. No matter what's happening in our lives. It's not an emotional thing. It's a relationship thing. And it's a commitment. You know, Job had it right when he says, Though he slay me, what? Yet shall I trust him. Jehoaz is a perfect example in Scripture of someone who only called upon the Lord when he was in trouble and then forgot about him afterwards. Let's pray. We'll have our discussion. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this uh, passage here. It teaches us a very valuable lesson about what it means really to dedicate ourselves to you, what it means to come to you, what it means to depend upon you, what it means to serve you, Lord. And Lord, we know most people just look to you for benefit but without looking to you for uh, salvation and for relationship. It's like the people came to you, Lord, your, to your son and, and want to make him king because he fed them. Lord, we want to come to you because you are King and Lord and our Master, Lord. And to praise your holy name forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Any comments?
Yeah, over here. Um, you were talking about Moses asking the people, is, is God really asking anything that hard of, difficult of you? Talking about how serving him is not really that hard. He's not asking us to do any hard things. And that's Moses talking to the people that had all these, the Israelites who had all these rules and yeah. feasts and festivals and offering practices. Like it, it was tedious, yeah. maybe not difficult, yeah. but tedious for them. And he's saying that to them. For us, we have even less excuse. Like there's, or yeah, less excuses. Oh, yeah. It's not that hard. We don't have any mandatory feasts or festivals. We don't have animals we have to bring. We don't have a certain place we have to go to. You're exactly right. What does he ask of us that is that challenging? Exactly right. Good, good point. Good point. Anyone else? Lee over here. Oh, wait a minute. We've got Gail. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you mentioned Sennacherib, or however you pronounce it. Um, and I have this quote in my phone that I keep. It's from Lord Byron, the poem, The Destruction of Sennacherib. Okay. And it says, And the might of the Gentile, unsmote by the sword, hath melted like snow in the glance of the Lord. Amen. There you and go. And I always love that quote. Just yeah. the, you know, nobody could, could slay him. Nobody could catch him. He was doing great things in the world's eyes, but God just looks his way and he's done. Exactly right. And it, and it put to flight 185,000 soldiers. And one of the things that's kind of interesting about that is Sennacherib, we have a called a stella, which is a rock thing that's written, that when it came to his attack on Jerusalem, Sennacherib, the stella of Sennacherib wrote down, and I caged Hezekiah up in a city like a, a bird. Didn't say I conquered him. That's all he could say is, is, is I surrounded him. That's all he could say. And we, so we have historical proof that this happened. Yeah. Uh, It's, it seems like we have the same, same story, or different people, but the same exact things going on throughout, especially the Old Testament, right? I guess I'm concluding, and this is the, the question, right? I guess people just have to keep going through things and repeating the same things over, but we're recording different stories with the same issues. Yeah. And I guess just because new people get born and they don't listen, so they'll com completely repeat the same thing over and over. Yeah, the, the, the nature of man has not changed. And one of the things I always found interesting, after I first read through the book of Ecclesiastes, he says, well, after reading this, no one should be tempted to chase wealth and fame and possessions. Because he says, I've tried it. Doesn't work. <laughs> it's not going to satisfy. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that the message today and in what the, the, the uh, profile and glimpses is Francis Schaeffer. Yeah. Uh, talk about conflicted. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and it was, I mean, it was, it shows not just him, but also the, the, the tear in the fabric between the, um, you know, the, the, the pre-modern and the post-modern church, especially, what is he, Presbyterian? Yeah. Which has gone really off the deep end. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, you, you just look at, uh, I don't know, just... I, when I saw that, I was like, well, that's interesting. <laughs> no accidents, right? Yeah, one of the things that's interesting about Schaefer's effect, he saw this decline. And he tried to warn, and he wrote it in How Then Should We Live, his book on that. And so it's still a, a worthy read. But he saw it even in his own son, who went off the deep end. Frankie just went off in, in that direction. As did... Uh, and still today, um, John Piper's son, an avid, I mean, you can see him on, on YouTube, an avid atheist, you know, critic of his father. You know. So there's several places throughout the Old Testament where we hear of our God that, that gives us the metrics, the stats of the armies of Israel, how many troops, how many, and all the different things. But any time that Israel wins a war or wins a battle, God makes sure to let us know it had nothing to do with the number of troops they had. Exactly. It was all him. Sure. He either stripped them down or had, they had nothing to do with it, yeah. no matter how many hundreds of thousands they had. Yeah. So while he yeah, points it out, it really means nothing if they're actually going to win. That's kind of sure. odd or humorous in some ways. Yeah. 
And, and, then, and the one, one thing that's interesting about that is the fact that how many times has God in the Old Testament proved who he was by using little and still not getting the results back from his people. And it's worded that he handed them over to Syria yeah. again. And what do we see today? Where are the attacks coming from in many places? Exactly. Same spot, same thing happening. Exactly right. Same place. And Israel still doesn't turn to the Lord and repent. And won't do it until the middle of the tribulation. So. I leave. Obviously, these are, there's idols involved again, and uh, the idols just seem like it's uh, just a, uh, obviously, condition of the heart, right? Those things pop out when somebody, you know, obviously, the whole country and the whole people there, their hearts are like that. When, when people set up idols in their lives, and other people don't address them around them. And that's part of the problem. The other countries around them wanted those same idols. So nobody really was calling them out. Um, and the idols were, again, it, it had to do with emotions. It had to do with all sorts of the culture and everything else. Um, at, at, at what point does God, you know, if we recognize idols like this are just horrible, at what point did he just say, that's, that's, we're done with this? Yeah, I mean, we saw that, we saw that uh, in Noah's days, right? He said, that's it. I regret I made man. I'm going to start all over again. You know, he almost did it with Moses. He said, listen, I'm just going to wipe them out. We're going to start all over again with you. Um, we see that during the tribulation. It, 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 you know, grieves the heart of God. Man is given free will. And they use that free will to oppose God. I mean, what, what happens right after, in, in the scriptures, right after Noah comes off the boat? Well, two chapters later, here you have them going to build a tower, right? You know, a tower to God, the Tower of Babel. Be, you know, we're going to make a name for ourselves. I mean, uh, you would think just on the logical thing, just a basic logic. If I didn't choose being born... And I can't basically choose when I'm going to die. What power do I really have? You know, I, I can't take my next breath unless the Lord gives me permission to. And so um, just the arrogance is, is, is beyond imagination. You know, and you're exactly right. We just don't, we just don't learn. We keep doing the same thing over and over and repeating the same mistake over and over and over again. And so that's why you see a lot of rich men who are very miserable people. Because their riches really does not, does not give them uh, satisfaction. I, I usually don't like this, but I, I'm going to follow up with what Todd said, right? <laughs> uh, he said uh, pre-modern, post-modern stuff. Right? Yeah. Uh, and when it comes down to it, and this is, I guess, my view on things, it's boring. It really is, because people really aren't alive. They are just spiritually dead. They're just doing whatever they're doing. But it makes them a very boring person. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's a good point, because postmodernism says there is no such thing as truth, absolute truth. Then what's the point of anything? If there's nothing I do that makes any difference, if I'm not going anywhere, I don't have a destination... If uh, someone tells me something and I can't believe it because there's no such thing as truth, what's the point? If to, if to, you know, man has to, God, man has been made to have purpose and objectives and goals and something to strive for. If there's nothing worth striving for, then it's just existence. And that's exactly going all the way back to the uh, existentialist. You know, um, John Parr Sartre and uh, Paul uh, Camo uh, and, and The Stranger and, and these things. doesn't matter. It's just existence, you know. So what's the point? That's pretty bland. What's the point? <laughs> I was reading in a uh, 
uh, I get this publication in Primus that comes every month, and it's from uh, Hillsdale College. Yeah. And in one of them, the uh, President Larry Arn was talking about the the uh, the constitutional theories uh, versus the modern theories, and that today it, it, it the, it's a perfect reflection of the term in, in Genesis. It says that at the time right before the flood, that men were doing was right in their own eyes. Yeah. And that when that happens, there's no devotion towards God. There's and and they they get no there's no satisfaction within yourself. So that's how the, the statism takes over, because then um, you start falling for what is given to you by the state. And you know you, you see he was talking about a, a certain um, 1984 versus uh, Brave New World. Yeah, that's his last. About which primacy. way yeah. would the state take over? One yeah. was more. One was aggressive. One was passive. But either way, it's both. You know, it's anti-God because yeah. it's all wrapped in in your own your own self and then again you have something bigger the state that takes over because yeah. there's no there, you can't fill your own void no. hey, what, what's what's the old thing we used to the little meme we used to use only a god-shaped void in your heart yeah you know and it's true yeah pascal's you know the theorem yeah yep. the, the other thing is on the brave new world he points out the fact that it was passive control by drugging up the population. And that's what uh, Klaus Schwab is talking about. You'll be, you won't own anything, you'll be controlled, and you'll be happy. Cannabis. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, and so, yeah, well, what's the point? So that reduces this below, you know, b below a worm, right? You know, and the scripture talk about worm. At least a worm exists, you know, with a purpose. You know, it, it, it just there's no purpose, no reason. Uh, we we just go through life, and, and God's given us marvelous purpose, a marvelous reason. And uh, but without it, we default to that, and that's why that is why you see the increase of lawlessness. That's why Matthew 24 predicts. The Lord says, "Listen, in the end times." Because of lawlessness, the hearts of men will grow cold. He said, but do not let your heart be troubled, because these things must be, because the birth of the kingdom is like a woman in, in, in labor. You know, and so we're seeing that. You know, yeah, to me it makes no sense. Uh, you have young men carjacking cars downtown and then abandon them five blocks down the road. What's... what's What's the point? What's the reason? You know, it's just uh, evil for evil's sake. Anyone else before we close? Why does this town or town become the idol of choice in so many instances? Be it the Israelites, you know, be it with in the Exodus, all the way up to here, the Hindus and others, that you go to the cow. Why not? <laughs> Lions or anything else. <laughs> it just seems odd. Well, that's a good question. The, the cow was considered the center of the sustenance of life. You know, it was, so you, you had a cow. And in the Canaanite pantheon, Bel was represented as a man's body with a bull's head. Uh, and, and so... Uh, with lightning in one hand and, and uh, you know, a staff in the other hand. And so the cow represented all those things that uh, meant life. And so there's, 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 a, there's a reverse axiom in idol worship. We're to serve what? The creator. Yeah, the creator, God. The idols were to serve the people. And so they made idols after their own image because they want, I want drunkenness, I want orgies, I want these things. And the idol said, that's fine, worship me by doing these things. As a matter of fact, in the uh, Greek city of uh, Corinth, they had 6,000 sacred prostitutes. You can worship the Lord through intimacy. And, for, and that represents fertility. I mean, see the warpness? 
of that, and, and that's why they re resisted leaving their idols, because the idols would let them do whatever they wanted to. And that was worship. Well, it wasn't pleasure. It was, it was pleasure, not uh, intimacy. Uh, well, yeah. Things. But they define things differently. Yeah, but, but anyway, too, <laughs> um, you, you know, you look at that worship of, of the, the, the cow, in the case of the American buffalo, the American buffalo, the Indians, the American Plains Indians worshiped yeah. buffalo. It was their source of sustenance, uh, clothing, shelter. Uh, it was their culture. Everything was wrapped around uh, that animal. And it's it's the same same thing. It, it, again, you're worshiping the creation, yeah, not the creator. Yeah, and that's what Romans one talks about, where men, you know, worship the creature rather than the creator, and that's what you have. Yeah, so that's why the cow became important, is the fact that that cow was the grantor of the sustenance of life. Well, no, the cow wasn't the grantor of sustenance of life. The creator created the cow. <laughs> to provide sustenance and life for the people. So. You know, there's an old saying that if you put a dress and lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. <laughs> if, if, you, if you make a cow out of gold, it's still an image of a, of a cow. It didn't enhance the cow. Any. <laughs> Anyone else? Interesting discussion. All right, oh, why don't we allow uh, Todd here to close us in, in prayer then. Dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, pray thank you for this morning. We're gathered together again to worship and honor you. Lord, pray you just bless the pastor as he brings us the word. We get to hear it, learn it, and incorporate it into our hearts and in our lives. Lord, we always remember that yeah, you are the source of life. You are the one that we should uh, uh, to love and honor and lord not ourselves not the things around us but you lord pray thank you lord that you bless our time especially now as we celebrate the beginning of a new year that lord we could just uh, continue on and lord just bless our body uh, at, at the church lord we just thank you for these things in christ's name amen amen